A Walk Through Quantum Tides by Arbor Winter Barrow Narrated by Julia Q. Walker It begins again. The pause in her voice, the change in the tone, the cadence different from normal. She looks through the window, seeing something that no one else can. Her skin shudders in the light and fades to translucence. She is drifting between the tides of a quantum realm out of my reach. Mom? You okay? I ask, a fork full of eggs halfway between my plate and my mouth. Her personal solidity shifts between solid and slightly see-through for a moment before she answers, Yes, sunshine. I was just admiring the neutrinos in your hair. I patted down my hair with my free hand. Is that what's making my hair so frizzy? She laughs. <laughs> no, sweetheart. That's just the humidity. My mother has been shifting out of time and space. There's usually no warning and no preparation. It just happens. Her eyes glaze over and she loses solidity, like someone has turned down the opacity on a piece of smart glass. It's called quantum phase shift disease or quantum tide syndrome. Most people just call it the tides. My mother was one of only 367 people to have it. Would you like to go for a walk? I ask. The eggs have gone cold and my appetite has faded with my mother's opacity. Let me finish this, she says and holds her hands up in the air like a conductor in front of a grand orchestra. But it's just me and the breakfast nook in her house. She sits impossibly still, staring at a point above the table. Her eyes are determined and focused. I wait and try not to think about the neutrinos in my hair. Her eyes go distant, and I swirl the fork around the tattered eggs until I grow bored and scrape the leavings into the composter. I'm slowly losing my mother, and in the moments where she's solidly on our plane of existence, I try to take every moment I can with her. Every week she calls me to catch up, or I come for a visit, but it feels like time is borrowed and not certain. We had a blissful six months between this bout of quantum phase shift disease and the last. I'm never ready when it returns. She was talking about some of her neighbors over breakfast and it was only now that I realized that some of what she was saying didn't make sense. Her neighbors were just normal folk, but in her reality, the neighbors were plants, spewing spores into her yard that killed her flowers. Mom is moving again. The pause and the hesitation leave, and she is more solid than not. She carries on with her side of the conversation and picks up the empty plates off the table. The sunlight coming through the kitchen window glinted through her body, and her shadow was as caught between as she was. Six months of grounded solidity. I'd had six months, and just like all the times when I had my mother 100% here, I didn't feel like I'd use the time properly. I never did, and no matter how much time I got between bouts, it was never enough. See how nice it is? She says, ushering me outside. We stand on her doorstep, looking out on her quiet suburban street. You should come over more, and we can go for a walk along the edge of the universe. I smile at her. She still recognizes smiles. She still recognizes my love for her. I'd like that. To her, we would probably be walking on the literal edge of the universe. But to me, I just wanted to walk on the edge of our shared universe, with what little of it remained. There's another place on the other side of the threshold that she crosses, and sometimes she's caught so evenly between this world and that. The things she says and the people and places she describes are alien, and yet she speaks of them as if they are family and friends. It's warm out, but the sun is hidden beyond a bank of trees and houses. We walk side by side on the boundary between the street and the grasses and lawns of her neighbors. 
Hold my hand, she says, and reaches out. I grasp her translucent fingers with my solid ones. The last rays of the sun arc above us, and I see something I'd expect out of a movie. Each ray of light is shimmering with liquid pink gold glitter. I blink a couple times, but then I'm caught in one of my own memories as a child. There was a nail polish that my mom loved that looked like that. I felt the cool brush on my nails, and the faraway voice of my mother say, Hold still now. The papers on the table rustled, as the rotating fan above our heads lazily moved around the summer air. My child's hand is small in hers. My skin pale against her tanned fingers. The creases in her fingers are starkly contrasted between youth and adulthood. I gasp, but I didn't let go of my mother's hand. I'm now, and I am before. She is here, and also there. You always did like that nail polish, my current day mother says. It reminded me of you, I reply after a moment. I wonder if this is her doing, or if I am finally succumbing to the tides. We walk hand in hand down the street, and my brief glimpse into what she saw doesn't happen again. She talks about her neighbors, the ones in our reality and the ones in hers. I smile and nod and ask simple questions to show her that I'm engaged. I have to be honest. It is exhausting, and I hate that I don't always want to stay for long. It was never going to go away, and this was just the way things are now. I was willfully selfish, wanting my mother back that made clever jokes and puns and sang in the mornings to wake my brother and me up, and took spring cleaning seriously like it was a national holiday. That version of her is as translucent as she is, and the longer I hold on to it, the more it disappears. That's the version I want, and every time she's caught between, I feel like I am in mourning once again. I know that if I just accept that this is the way things are, it would hurt less. I am selfish, and I know it. I've pieced together my mother's story from the few fragments she was able to give me over the years. When she's solid and grounded, she can talk about the quantum phase shift disease. But she doesn't always seem to want to. It's like she's embarrassed to be given this fate. And no matter how much I yearn for answers or clarity, I can't bring myself to make her feel bad about herself, even by way of satiating my own curiosity. The QPSD began before I was born. She worked as a nurse in the Space Administration, helping soldiers and civilians alike, and sometimes, if she got lucky, she got to go on excursions with some of the extrasolar exploratory missions. She was 19, bright-eyed, a child of a carpenter and a stay-at-home mom, going out to explore the galaxy. She returned to Earth with an honorary medical discharge after they found out that an entire exploratory ship had been doused in unknown cosmic rays. The other 300 or so people on that ship either ended up like my mother or were perfectly normal. At the time, there seemed to be no clear answer as to why some were afflicted with QPSD and others were not. Some chalked it up to bad luck, or a fluke in the genomic code. There are treatments that keep her grounded, but even those begin losing their grasp after a while. Most of the time these days, she doesn't even know she's losing her hold on the world. What it happens, there's no warning. No preparing. It just happens. Sometimes, it's bad enough that you can pass a whole arm through her and barely feel the pressure of another human being in that same space. I grew up knowing not to reach too far into her when she was like that. Sometimes it was okay, and when I was a child, I admit I pushed too far just to see what would happen. Sometimes it wasn't okay. Sometimes it was so bad she would see me again, but not see me. That's the worst part. When she's half in and half out, she won't even recognize me. Her daughter... Her child is no more than a fragment of some forgotten world, and what remains is a stranger, or worse, an enemy. My teenage years taught me everything I needed to know about pressing her buttons when I was angry. 
The look in her eyes when I became other was hard and painful, and honestly, avoidable if I knew how to keep my teenage ego in check. In a way, I see that she and I are two sides of a coin, seeing the other in reflections of the past or preconceived notions. I loved the version of my mother from when I was a child, and she loves the version of me that's comforting, congenial, and kind. That's all I can be for her, though. There is an inherent danger to being anything other than the picture of a perfect daughter. This was different than when I was a foolish teenager. This was a reaction to changing beyond my mother's expectations. I don't talk to her about my struggles with depression or the fact that I distance myself from our church. She thinks those things are her fault, her burdens for not being a perfect mother, when really, they are just signs that I am my own person, with my own struggles, my own beliefs. But when I'm with her, I try my best to be what she expects of me. Sunshine, did you know you can fly? She says to me as we continue our stroll down the road. She lifts up my hand in hers and raises it in the air. The last glimmers of sunlight catching her plain nails and my blue painted ones. The shift in conversation frightens me. I'm worried that I'm going to get another glimpse of what she sees or see another memory, so I break her handhold, but link her arm in mine. She probably doesn't remember that I'm terribly afraid of heights, even though I've been on planes and spaceships since I was young. I didn't know that. How do I do that? You've got to bottle the carbon atoms of a neutron star and coat it in the waters of that same star after it has gone supernova. She smiles serenely. That sounds great, Mom. I'll get on that. I pat her hand on my arm, even though something about it makes me want to cry. Sometimes, it's easier to just smile and nod. None of the advice she gives while caught between makes any sense, nor was it particularly scientifically accurate. At least not the science I know. Mom got the tides when she was 23. She's 64 now. 41 years of living with the increasingly long draw in and out of that place. Someday, she will slip across the threshold and be gone forever. But no scientist or doctor or philosopher can tell us when that may happen. Her cells are slowly becoming a part of a chaotic quantum realm that she can only give us brief fragments of understanding. The hardest days are when something over there frightens her, because I cannot reach her where she is. I cannot keep her safe from whatever demons and monsters inhabit the other side of the tides. I can see her cry, but I can't comfort her except through words I can barely articulate because I'm frightened for her. The words that I can say, she may not even be able to understand. But she's a strong woman, a smart woman, and she finds a way to fight back. The battles I've seen her grapple with are not ones I can relate to or lend a helping hand. My only goal these days is to make sure she lives a painless and stress-free life, as much as I can guarantee, anyway. I can pretend to be the perfect daughter for her sake. I can be the adult in the relationship to a woman three times my age. I loved her, and it was a small sacrifice. The windows of solidity and opacity were getting smaller and smaller, and it was only a matter of time before I would not be able to speak to the version of my mother who was fully here ever again. Those days were as rare as kindness in war. The last time she was fully solid was the days after my father died, nearly six months ago. I think it shocked me out of it, she said, able for once to talk about the tides like it was condition and not her unquestionable reality. The solidity, the clarity, the understanding of our world in her eyes was striking at that time, and so needed as our family mourned the loss of my father. It was short-lived because, now, only a few months later, she's lost grasp on our world again and is caught between. She's got one foot in our world and one in another at all times now. Some days are better than others, but none as clear as before. The quantum nature of her disease allows her to be in two places at once, not just caught between. 
there are weird days when she is on one side of her home cleaning a dish and at the same time on the other writing a note to herself. There are also times when time itself seems to bend to her. She'll remember me as a child, telling me about things I did as if they were yesterday, when in reality, they happened decades ago. Sometimes when she thinks she's alone, she moves her hands around in a dance, pushing and pulling at something only she can see, as if she is guiding the tides itself around her. When I was a kid, I would see it as a joke, but as an adult, it's relatable. She controls what she can, shifting the forces of another world because this one was too hard, too alien. In the other reality, she's got sway, power, a say in the way things move. She was my mother, and yet most of the galaxy saw her as an oddity of science. A fluke. Unfortunate collateral on the journey into deep space. She began this journey before I was ever born, and the question was raised. Would I follow her? One day, will I lose my hold on the world? Maybe it's already happening, and I don't even know it yet. That question wasn't real to me until the day I saw my younger brother fade out for a bit, at the time in his early 20s, the same age as our mother when the QPSD manifested. I sit at home with them, the two of them caught between, and I wonder if I'm the one missing out on something grand. But I was the lucky, or unlucky one, in this QPSD lottery. It's not hard to feel lonely even with friends nearby. Over the years of seeing my mother and brother drift away, I've had to come to terms with sometimes being a family of one, celebrating the forgotten holidays and birthdays alone or making a found family out of friends. I'm lucky to have so many friends, but it doesn't make the pain of losing my family any easier. She's caught between the tides most days now, and I don't know if I'll get any more days with her fully grounded. I would never fully understand her struggle, never fully understand the way that she saw the world around her. I suppose the walk we took today was her gift to me, a reminder to remember the good times, the simple times, the laughter, the joy. I was not so foolish to cast that gift aside. We turn the corner back onto a road, and I see her house up ahead. The sun is below the horizon now, and I hold my mom's arm close. Shall we do this again next Friday? She asks. I'd like that, I say, knowing that the future wasn't written. Next Friday could be the day where the neighbors get too sassy with their spores, and I've got to talk with another deputy that knows she's not a danger. She's just caught between. <laughs>